so a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Vira Ekzer. Uh, I'm working as a grant advisor at Hate for Research Institute, which institute is coordinating this project, Visegrad and Western Balkan RMA Network. To start with, I would like to give the floor to our CEO, Gábor Balázs, on behalf of HEDFA, to share his welcoming words with us. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm warm welcome you in Budapest, and uh, it's my pleasure to, to be the opening speech uh, taker in this conference first. Uh, it's not a long speech. Uh, I'm Gabor Balázs, the CEO of the Hate for Research Institute. Uh, I think that uh, it's a pleasure to us that after a long period of COVID times, when we meet only online uh, platforms, we, we learn how to use Zoom, how to use Teams, and all the other uh, platforms. It's very good that we can meet together personally in a conference like this, uh, because the topic we are uh, discussing today is much more interpersonal than just uh, uh, what to say, an online face uh, uh, sharing uh, type of uh, interaction. Uh, as all of you know, uh, our region is not, a, not as successful in, uh, in participating Horizon projects and EU tenders as, as we would like it to be. And many years ago we began to uh, uh, generate projects which try to build capacities of uh, research managers of the region uh, as we recognize that this is one of the key factors that, that can uh, increase the success rate of the CE, re CE region uh, in this European context, which is not just a financial issue. I think that if less uh, regional partner uh, uh, participate in these projects, uh, then the interests and, uh, and, and, the, and the issues of the region is not uh, uh, attract as many attention of, in the EU-wide discussion as it could be uh, in a better success rate. And we hope that with these projects and the other projects we do in this field, uh, we, can, we can help our excellent partners uh, uh, that, that, that uh, Central European issues will be on the, on the center of the EU discussion in the future. Um, I, I get the information that uh, 15 uh, countries represented in, the, in this room, which is, I think, uh, is a good success for us. And, and uh, thank you for all coming to the Budapest. And, uh, and I think that uh, this is the time when I have to uh, I have to thank the support of, of, of some of our partners. First of all, the uh, Visegrad Fund. I think that with the help of them, we could not gather uh, in this room and discuss uh, uh, such an important uh, uh, issues that what we do today. Uh, and similarly, we are very thankful to, to the support of the Central European Initiative, which also help us not just to have a skeleton of the project, but to have a, uh, how to say, uh, very rich uh, program in this, in, in this project. And finally, I, I would like to thanks to the uh, Budapest University of Technology and, and uh, uh, Economics, which help us uh, with this location and help us uh, 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 in the finalization of the programs. Uh, so, uh, after these thanks, I have to uh, say you two technical information. First of all, that you can find two clocks in the room. Both of them are, are wrong, so never check the time on these uh, platforms, which is, which is not, not a perfect one. The second technical issue I have to raise now is that uh, all of you find a question in the, in the folder. And we'd like to uh, ask you to, to, to fill this question and help us to, to have a final uh, uh, recognition of the success of this conference. So, uh, welcome you again, and I hope that uh, you will be able to strengthen your cooperation in this conference, uh, share knowledge as much as we can share in a personal meeting, which is much more better than in the online sphere. And I think that feel free to ask, feel free to discuss, feel free to participate in networking uh, events we have in this conference. And I hope that uh, 
Finally, with this project and with this conference, uh, we will reach our goal that uh, the region will be much more successful competitors uh, in the European uh, uh, research, uh, research like competition, I would like to say it like that. So I wish you uh, fruitful days in Budapest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gábor. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Janos Lewandowski, the Vice Director for Science and Innovation from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Thank you so much. And first, I would like to thank you for the tech for remark on the university <laughs> clocks, but hopefully <laughs> that will be synchronized sooner or later with the real time. Nevertheless, on behalf of the Budapest University of Technology and Economics, I would like to extend my most sincere welcome to all of you participating in this conference on uh, research management and administration. I hope you will enjoy your time in Budapest and you also will enjoy the historic atmosphere of the campus. Uh, I'm not going to delve into history, but I just wanted to uh, mention to you that we are exactly 240 years old. And at that point of the time when the Austro-Hungarian monarch established this university, this was a pretty unique institution being the very first one truly dedicated to engineering sciences. So you are sitting in one of the oldest technical schools of continental Europe. Now, of course, back to track to the conference on research administration and uh, management. Uh, actually, uh, the question which may arise that uh, why we are sitting here, why do we need this type of conferences? Now, basically, in this corner of the world, I mean the V4 countries and also the Western Balkan region, we share a common historical knowledge, some common historical heritage of being very strong in theoretical sciences. We have very strong schools and very strong results, but what is the missing link behind that sometimes is actually the efficient resource, research management to bring these spent up potential, the spent up scientific qualities into successful European Union projects. Because why uh, European Union projects can these results be channeled into innovation and into economical growth, which all of these countries are striving to achieve. That is the reason, actually, why RMA is so important. Uh, actually, it can be perceived as a vehicle uh, for economical growth, which is achieved via the successful valorization of science. And that's why we must pay attention to that. However, it is easier said than done. It is very easy to pronounce the objectives, but it is much more difficult to accomplish the associated goals. Now, why is that so? Because even though RMA was conceived for, and it is supposed to be paving the way towards successful research, sometimes in organizations such as the university, research administra administrators are caught up in a battle between the two sides. On the one side, there is the academia, and the other side, there is the organization itself and they have to understand the language of both sides in order to hammer out compromises and securely navigate the institution from research fund to another research fund. That's why our university also established an RMA unit in the framework of our technology transfer office. And I must say, at the very beginning, the academic community a little bit shied away from using the services of this unit. However, now we fully appreciate both the services and the contribution of this unit which it can make to the university. Especially if this contribution manifests itself into money by bringing more research funds to the university. So in this respect, our university is totally, as far as the objectives are concerned, is totally in line with the scope of this conference. We also plan to launch an RMA program, and furthermore, we advocate for the full recognition of RMA as a fully-fetched profession. However, how to accomplish these objectives? 
what, is, what are the bolts and nuts of doing that, that remains to be the scope of this conference. So that's why we are very eager to benefit from this meeting. And as a result, I would like to wish you very interesting discussions and very interesting talks. And hopefully, again, you will enjoy your time in Budapest. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lewandowski, also for highlighting the importance and recognizing the importance of research management in the university and also in the business sphere. So I would like to go. Uh, and uh, as we are just arriving to the end of our project, let me just very briefly go through uh, what have we done in the framework of this uh, RMA network from the Visegrad countries and Western Balkans. So here you see what were the general objectives. Basically, uh, we were inspired. Most of our partners are uh, were active participants of the best black coast action, and we were inspired what we have done there, what we get there. And uh, basically, as soon as it ended, we, try, we wanted to find a way how to go ahead and how to uh, support uh, the networking of RMAs from our countries, so from the Visegrad and the Western Balkans, how to overcome the excellence gap and the knowledge gap and the networking gap, which is still important. Uh, also, uh, we aimed to find a way how to disseminate wider the knowledge which is available and but they are not uh, used and not exploited by many of our institutions. And for doing so, uh, the skill and capacity development of our RMAs was also considered an important aspect. And last but not least, as a kind of uh, overarching aim, to start a dialogue with policymakers, with research funding bodies, to highlight the importance of the profession and the importance of excellent RMAs. So here you see the partnership, as I told you, Hate for Research Institute coordinated this, and we had four partners uh, in total from the Visegrad countries and three from the Western Balkans. We are very grateful for, to all of you, our partners, because uh, as you might know, the Visegrad Fund does not cover personal costs, but the dedication and the uh, investment uh, from each institution enabled that we could reach very nice uh, outcomes. And among others, the webinars proved to be one of the most successful uh, series, which lasted for one year. And as you see here, uh, during this year, we had 12 webinars with 26 speakers from all over Europe, uh, 600 participants from uh, 30 countries. Basically, our aim was to reach out our region, but we could go much beyond. And I'm again very grateful to our speakers as well, and many of you are sitting here. So we are grateful for you for sharing your knowledge and also for coming here. Then, as you might know, we developed an online expert pool on the project website, which is embedded in our institute's website. And I'm very happy to share with you that uh, as of yesterday, I just uh, incorporated the data here, we have more than 100 uh, experts who are registered there. Uh, many project managers, research administrators, funding advisors, NCPs, and uh, also colleagues working in some parts of research management or at the interface of science. And we have colleagues from 28 countries. So again, we could go much beyond uh, the original objectives. And again, many thanks to all of you who registered there, because our ultimate goal was to provide a platform to seek for others' expertise and also provide a visibility to your expertise. And by doing so, to be able to generate interactions, connections, and enhance the professional work. Then the other topic, uh, the other pool that you can uh, find on our project website is the learning material platform. Basically, all the recordings of the webinars are uploaded there, so you are free to check them back anytime. We will upload there the recordings from this conference as well, um, from the plenary sessions. And we are also working on some educational videos which will be released after this conference. So last but let, not least, uh, some words on this final conference. We are very happy, as I told you earlier, to have you all here. 
primarily research managers, but also we invited some policy makers from various levels and from various countries and institutional leaders of research performing organizations. As I told you, our aim is to start a dialogue with them and start uh, to find out how we could uh, further reinforce the recognition of the profession. Uh, and basically, I invite all of you to enjoy the opportunity provided for networking, knowledge exchange, and skill development. And this was from my side. Thank you again for being here and enjoy these two half days. And now, I would like to give the floor uh, to our keynote speaker. Uh, the keynote speech will be delivered by Nick Grayson, who is the managing director of the European uh, Association of Research Managers. And um, I think most of you <laughs> already know him. We are very grateful for him uh, to come here because parallel to this event, there is an ERMA board meeting uh, that half of the part is already skipped with, uh, <laughs> by uh, Nick. So basically, Nick uh, has been working um, quite a long time in research management, and he is currently the managing director, uh, not currently, but in the last five years of ERMA. And I would not uh, tell more about him, but give the floor to you, Nick. Uh, please share your thoughts. So lovely to be here in person in Budapest, actually in person, so long after the pandemic. It's really lovely to see all of you, and I heard so many great things uh, already about research management and administration. Um, I'm Nick, I'm the managing director of IARMA now for about five years, and before also involved in research management, first more in, um, in, in uh, best prac um, than in IARMA. Um, I have to say I'm outside of the director, outside of it being my job, it's also my, my passion. I almost think about it uh, day and night. Uh, so um, when I wake up and my little girls wake me, I think about um, this stuff. And I think very much also about what are we doing in Europe? How is it evolving? How can we improve it for our community? So hence uh, the speech here today is the momentum of research management in Europe and also the RM Roadmap project, which is a project which was approved, uh, a CSA in um, Horizon in Europe, uh, but it's not signed yet, and the Commission is quite keen that you say that um, when, um, when uh, <laughs> communicating. So I've done that. Um, so um, as I said, I'm um, also very much a research administrator at heart. I was mostly working on European policy and um, projects, starting very much from the financial side uh, in the beginning, a project advisor, moving a bit more into policy. Um, I also want to say that what I want to do today is, is take you on a journey of um, my perspective of what is happening in Europe, of the project. Um, so this is not, um, the things I'm saying are of course very much related to IARMA, but it's um, uh, my personal view and it's not necessarily a standpoint uh, of the organization. I also want to thank very much uh, HEDFA um, for all of the great work um, they are doing for organizing this meeting, for taking leadership in, uh, in this, I think, very important space, which also the Vice Rector um, here um, highlighted in a very good way. Um, I think there's a lot of potential to do, let's say, much better. Uh, it, uh, his speech was also, and the project focused on uh, Horizon Europe um, funding, Horizon Framework Project funding, but I want to take also a bit of a broader perspective of this um, in, my, in my talk. Um, so what the talk will um, focus on is part one, IARMA and national network momentum. So national, regional, I consider this project also the, to be part of that grander effort. Then I'll look at what's currently happening at the European Commission in projects and in policy, which I find extremely um, interesting and I hope um, you with me as well. Um, I hope I can share some new things that might spark your thought process and, and see uh, what's happening there. And then I'll talk about the project itself in part three. A little bit about IARMA because the positioning is important. I hope most of you know it, but it is the European Association of Research Managers and Administrators. We're a fully um, non-profit organization, um, um, so fully funded from member contributions from events. So let's say if in this room we decided to start an IARMA, that's what it is. We're fully independent. There is nobody um, behind the scenes that is a big money donor that, that has a say. It's really the community determining um, what is going to happen, which is great because we're fully independent. Less great is, of course, that we are not funded outside now this project that we have in a small other uh, project from the European Commission. But since we're not, um, um, not funded, we need to 
to, of, of course, see how we build capacity, how we um, try to, uh, well, we have long-term objectives such as professionalization of the profession, how we um, uh, finance all of this and how we do this effort. And that is my day-to-day -day job, the day-to-day -day job of um, the, well, not day to day, but of the board. Also, we have many committees, so 50, 60, 70 people who are very active, and that's really the power of the association. So it's a gathering of peers and not so much a service provider. We provide training, but not to provide training, but to build the community to get to a better situation for the whole community. Um, in numbers, we have about 2,500 single contacts signed up on our website. We think the actual number is quite a, big, uh, a bit bigger. We are quite large in number of um, organizations. If you look at European networks, we have 177 institutional members now, so um, organizations, universities, um, research performing organizations, uh, big institutes, small institutes, um, also some research funding organizations, science councils, um, and so on. We have a yearly conference of over 1,000 uh, delegates, and you see it here also. Um, the conference will be in Oslo beginning of um, May, and we also ready, we're almost ready to close it because we have um, almost reached capacity at 1,100 people. Of course, with the pandemic, the online became very important as well, so we did 50, 50 um, online um, event days uh, last year. So I just want to, uh, wanted to quickly say something about the organization to take it um, uh, to, um, into the story. So, I want to talk now about IARMA and um, national network momentum. I say networks because there's informal ones, there's formal ones, there's uh, part, parts of the country, regional, um, so there's all kinds. So um, with that momentum, I want to show here also our membership numbers, um, just to show that there are more and more people who are interested in joining such an association and to use it as an indicator, I think also of the momentum that is there in Europe. And another indication, indicator that I want to show you is these are a lot of the networks that are there um, in Europe at the moment. And if you, I don't necessarily want you to go all, through all of these and I won't discuss um, all of these, um, but these are, um, and I apologize, apologize to the Polish colleagues also for uh, using an old name there, <laughs> by the by, but um, I just want to show the yellow ones here are quite recent. So if you see there in Belgium, there is a quite recent one established, I think November last year. Cyprus, they're establishing one now. Um, Charma in the Czech Republic uh, was uh, started in, um, um, or I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, was started in January. Um, Germany for dramas, not that old at all, but they had a, in, an informal network before. In Sweden, the network is not so old. Also the Netherlands, although it used to be an informal one before. But I want to show that a lot is moving, a lot is moving. and what. I'm trying to show you also this, that there is a big, I think, a big um, push from people such as yourselves trying to organize, trying to figure this out. Also, the, the vice director here said it very well. I think there is this, this position in between how do we define it, how do we add the value, and then secondly, also um, to, to a degree, how do we show the value, because that is necessary for policy makers. I get back to that in a moment. So from my side, the momentum is strong. If you um, were able to look at all of those, and um, I want to say, Per Inge, is this readable from the back? Yes, okay, that's great. Um, from my perspective, um, I see that momentum there. And what, um, if you looked at um, the list of countries, of course, a number of countries um, are not there, which is also, I think, one of the topics um, approached by the vice rector and by this project is, of course, that the, um, the EU project participation of uh, the region um, uh, of the region uh, funded by the Visegrad uh, fund in, in this project is less than it would hope we would hope to be, um, but I think costs did a very very good thing there in uh, already in 2014 as I understand it I think that was the part in identifying that this was something very important and also having that focus on um, early stage um, people for one, and also on inclusiveness countries, cost target inclusiveness countries on the other hand. Maybe I go too, too um, uh, quick, but um, who knows cost best practice? Could you raise your hand? 
Okay, yes, then I don't need to explain. That's, that's good. Um, I think it was a huge success for a number of reasons. It did a, a lot of great things, a lot of, but the, the key thing for me is that it planted a lot of seeds and for me it was an HR success also, what I, uh, how I call it here, because it made a network available and it made opportunities available for people to start new things, to start new projects, to think about the situation in, the, in their country, improve it or improve it within their individual roles. So cost, I think, is a key incubator they did a very good uh, job on this. So there also, if you look at it, um, the bottom up, so the, 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 the grassroots, the um, people like yourselves, I think are manifesting themselves more and more in meetings within their organizations, uh, directed more and more towards uh, policymakers. Now I want to take maybe a little bit um, of, of, a, of a leap and try to bring that momentum in line with why do I, because now we've seen some indicators that stuff is moving, but why is stuff moving? That's the question I ask myself. And why it's moving, um, I want to relate that to simplification and to what I call from simplification to managing complexity. We should absolutely cut all red tape that we can and administrative process that is there and that is too much. Um, let's please um, let's please try to eliminate that, make it more efficient. But then I'm a very analytical person, and I try to analyze. We have Horizon Europe here. We had Horizon before, uh, uh, Horizon 2020 before. We had the framework programs before. So if we analyze that and we think about, okay, what is the Commission giving us as a funding um, uh, tool, as 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 um, um, as yeah, the, as the funding tool, and what are the components? What are they trying to achieve? And those parts. Are they to any degree simple or that mission is, are you able to, to make that simple? And then when I look at it, uh, what they have to work with is of course, they need to fund the European, well, and larger research and innovation system. I don't know what your appreciation of, of that is, but for me, not simple at all. The EU is the other element very complex. Then it's an international competition because we are having um, people from all countries of the EU, associated countries and larger, apply for funding. And one of the key goals is also that we stay competitive uh, with uh, the US, uh, we stay competitive with, uh, with Japan, with China and so on and so on. So it's an international competition to do an intercontinental competition on top of it. So that's not simple. Then we have intersectoral participation, companies, academic culture, not always easy uh, to, um, to put together. And then we get the legal aspect, which is 27 national legislation, EU legislation, and then of course, what does the organization require and what are the usual accounting practices and other practices. Public money and dividing money, also not simple. And quality assurance and accountability when using public money is also a big thing. I could name more and more and more. So when I start thinking about it in this way, I think, okay, how could something simple come out of this in a way? So it will always be complex to a degree. So for me, cutting red tape, very important where we can, but when I look at it, it is complex and will probably stay complex. So how do we manage that complexity? And how we manage that complexity, by default, you would say, okay, researchers are applying for funding, so researchers need to manage this complexity and get the money, that's simple, and that is happening in certain areas. Um, but do they lose research time? I asked the question, I won't, uh, won't answer it. And is it an efficient process to do that? Because they are the people who have trained their whole lives to influence the state of the art, and we're asking them to do a significant part of a lot of things, including administration. So um, what I think is a best practice is that we support our researchers, one with experts, which is for a large degree our community, and two with digitalization and also artificial intelligence uh, where we are able. So managing complexity, I now took the example of Horizon Europe, but it's actually much broader. And if we want to be able to give research time to our researchers while being more demanding, and I think this is the direction we are going in and you see it being added on and added on and added on in um, ethics, integrity, exploitation, communication, do no harm, open science, collaboration with industry, and there is about 30 or 40 like this you could name that a good researcher should be able to do. Of course, I say now researcher, I make it a bit too simple. It's a research group. You can have different people with dif different expertise. It's much more complex, but I think this can only work if we support our researchers in the correct way with people and with systems. Now, why this momentum? That's the, the rationale, the logic I'm trying to build. So the easiest one is which the vice rector also said, which we are all using within our organizations. If you 
invest in us, if you give us opportunities, if you uh, give education um, to us or let us get education, then you will get more funding. And yes, that is true for the organization and extremely important, obviously, for the uh, organization, which is more at the micro or the meso level. But when you look at the macro level and the system, the system normally wants to get its policy um, um, approved. It wants to get its policy, um, well, apology, op policy objectives achieved. So it doesn't matter so much normally uh, where the funding needs to go. The policy objective needs to be um, attained. So at the system level, this logic doesn't fully hold, although you also have larger systems where the country would like to get more money out of, um, for example, Horizon Europe. But I think some of the real value of our community that we need to show people, and this is also what we're going to look at in, in the project, is giving researchers time to do research. That is one of our key roles. The other ones are in efficiency, effectiveness, and value for money, I think, and also in quality assurance, accountability to taxpayers, um, and so on. I could dive into this very deeply, but we don't fully have time for that, but happy to discuss that um, with you further. And this will also be one of the things we will be exploring within the project. So I think very shortly that more and more people are realizing this. Some policymakers, they get it. Some policymakers, they are convinced. Other policymakers, um, much less. They are not convinced, don't see the need um, necessarily, or are not forced to be competitive. Because I think in the future, if you want to be in a competitive organization, you need to have good research administrators. You need to have um, good systems. And this is what I'm trying to build to, the logic of why I think we're getting more and more of these meetings, why we're getting more and more of these colleagues, because more and more policymakers, um, uh, researchers, they realize the role and the enabling role it can have. Because as the vice rector said, we're in the middle a little bit between the organization and between the researchers. And some researchers say, oh, this is the organization controlling me. But And from the organizational side, the, the organization and the vice rector, no, no, we're giving you support to do better and to have more research time and to do those things. Um, so um, that understanding of our niche profession is a difficult one, and definitely not everybody has gotten it, and probably the majority may not have gotten it uh, of policymakers. And it's also hard to get. And maybe an anecdote, we often uh, say that, I don't know if you uh, have, uh, have discussed this or ever say this, explaining to your family what you do, that shows it very well, because they don't get it. And often, and sometimes when I was a research administrator, one researcher said, uh, when I was explaining what I do, is that a full-time job? <laughs> And um, so there is a lot of um, awareness creation that we still need to do, a road that we still need to travel. Um, so the momentum for me, it is strong and it will remain strong because there are things being added on, complexity is being added on, and we are not, the simplification countermeasures, let's say, are not up to the degree, I think, because of the reasons I said, up to the degree that it would be to make it simpler and to make ourselves, in a sense, obsolete. That would be maybe the ideal, but we are not, uh, not in an ideal world. And next to that also, the quality assurance part is a very important uh, thing. Um, then the EC project and policy momentum. I think, Virak, we started a little bit later. I don't know because I'm, yes, five minutes later. So um, keep me sharp on the time. So I try to um, show you here um, what, from my perspective, that looks like. So we had cost best prac. We discussed that major success. I think fast forward quite a bit, and we come to the formation project. The formation project is a project which is looking also led by uh, also led by Hedva. Um, is looking to um, put, as I understand it, modules in place for potential future RMAs within uh, master uh, courses. So very interesting project funded. So we have cost uh, project funded. We have an Erasmus Plus project funded, which this is, which usually in EC policy terms is a trigger for something important is going to happen. Um, then we have this project, and very great uh, to see the Visegrad uh, Fund uh, put in, um, and all of your organizations uh, put in um, this type of project, which I think is of extreme value, and there is a big, uh, big need uh, for it. Um, and then I fast forward, not to a project, but to a very important event in my, um, in my perception. And this is December 2020, when the Council conclusions, so the Council of Ministers um, of the European Union, they actually mentioned research management. And I don't know, I haven't read all of the Council conclusions, but I, I think it's probably 
the first time or one of the first times in this way. And you might say, okay, they mentioned it in a document, that's something, um, but this is actually, and we'll go into the text in a moment, this is actually a key, key occurrence because the European Commission, when they, um, 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 when they design the program, when they develop policy, they need to very much take into account the stakeholders and the political level. So this is the political level saying research management is important at the highest European level. So this is of extreme um, importance because this opens the door to have a wide era program, so the widening and era work program within Horizon Europe. And in that program, uh, when I first saw it, I started looking at research management. Well, science management is also being uh, used, um, research management, science management, and it's mentioned 10 times, and there's a specific call in it about research uh, management, and I get back to the call text because it's very interesting um, to see. Fast forward, December of this year, there is a consultation on research management with... Of last year, yeah, not of this year, December. Yeah, that's impossible, Simon. But uh, yeah, <laughs> of last year, um, the um, there is an initiative on research management. So there are policy officers within DGRTD that are looking at how are we going to um, improve research management because we feel that it's important because the council told us that it's important. So then they have the opportunity to really move much faster um, than otherwise. Now, that is the project I'm going to discuss, which was funded, the RM Roadmap uh, project um, was funded. So we took part in that white era call and one of the two projects is, um, is funded and I'll tell a bit more about it in a moment. And now when we look at the 2023, 2024 perspective, of course, this is not open. There will definitely be a strong engagement of, um, well, there will be a strong mention and possibilities for uh, research managers. That's almost certain, so very interesting times. Um, I want to go, um, I realize this is a lot of text on a slide, and I hope you might be able to read it at the back, but here, these are the council conclusions at the end of the German presidency. It says science management, so research management, the council recognizes the growing need for the professionalization of science management at research performing and funding organizations, which I think is a very important thing, including through digital skills in order to improve their ability to participate in era-wide collaboration networks. The Council calls on the Commission to launch a pilot action, so that's the call we have seen, uh, for a Europe-wide networking program for science management uh, managers, including research infrastructures and so on considers the added value of co cooperation between science management training providers, including the higher education sector, to develop science management programs and guidelines. So they're saying that it's important, it should professionalize, so it should become a profession, so the, the, the importance of that is huge. Um, it also says it calls on the commission to take action to make that happen, and it says it considers the added value of higher education which is also, I'll link it a little bit to the formation project here, but it says that in the future, there should be higher education um, within Europe on research management, which in some places is a little bit, but um, definitely, um, not across, uh, definitely not across the board. So um, with that, the, okay, that's hard to read on that background, but um, this is the call tech. The most important thing here is the ERMA team is waving to you, but next to that, it is, <laughs> The, it is towards a wide training network, a Europe-wide training network, networking scheme for research management. So that was what the call was called. So it is not just here is a call, a topic that is for research management and we're done. It is towards, so this is a pilot action towards a Europe-wide training and networking scheme, which opens the door for funding from the commission for research management and administration in uh, the future. And if we then forward to um, the, um, the initiative that I mentioned, so the research management initiative under action um, 17, which is about universities, capacity building, researchers, careers is, uh, is linked to it as well. Um, I was reading through it um, and I saw there, um, I was thinking to a presentation that I did in October internally for IARMA at our event with all of our uh, committees. And there I said, what's the long-term goals of IARMA? It's recognition of the profession. It's a certified professional development for a good percentage of, of professionals. It's RMA courses and higher education. It's a mature RMA community with plenty of networking and best practice exchange. And if we now look at what is not yet EU policy, European Commission policy, but what is being made into European uh, Commission policy is 
recognition, recognition, upskilling, improved training they have there of research management and so on, networking, and you see best practice networking also involving the higher education uh, sector. So this is of extreme importance, meaning all of this, that there is a movement within the commission which was triggered, triggered by the political level and the stakeholders such as ourselves, that something is going to happen around this, and it is completely in line almost with what we want as a European community, or at least um, as, as IARMA, for the future, which is reasonably straightforward. Normally, if you look in a room like ourselves, uh, professional development, um, well, sufficient investment, so that's also here, capacity building, um, sufficient training, and a good network to, um, and community with best practice exchange. So that's, that's really something else and super. Now I come to the um, third part, which is the RM Roadmap project. So what I've tried to establish is that there is great momentum, bottom up, associations forming, people meeting, top down from the European Commission level at least, um, from uh, what I've just shown. And now they put out a call and we were able to get um, the uh, project and the funding and it's called RM Roadmap and it's called Creating Framework Conditions for Research Management to Strengthen the European Research Area, which also is partly um, a policy, uh, let's say, let's do the way we uh, we phrased it to align very well with the policy. But at the heart of this, of course, is that research management can do something for the system what is that? That's one of the key questions that we uh, want to answer because that's the key question that unlocks the doors towards investment, which we know we need to support our researchers better. Um, so we undertook this call, I speed it up a little bit, um, with IARMA, BESTPREC, uh, BESTPREC was crucial in this, um, ASTP Proton, um, which is the tech transfer professionals, and um, BESTPREC obviously is not a legal entity, and we are very happy to report, and I hope you know that BESTPREC and IARMA have, uh, have come together um, since then, but within the project, it is represented by HEDVA, uh, Nova Lisbon, and Cyprus Institute, which are key people from the core group also of BESTPREC. We have CrowdHelix in there for the system, for dissemination, and two associated partners, Una Europa and Janssen Pharmaceutical a big pharmaceuticals um, company. So it's granted, it's going to normally start in June if the, um, um, the grant agreement is signed, which I obviously am assuming. The main objectives there are improve understanding of research managers. Can we get to a definition or are there many parts that we can get to a definition? Big question for Virac and for Hedva um, because they are leading this work package. We want to gather the training and networking that is available. We want to make a roadmap on how our community can contribute to the ERA objectives or how we can advance as a community. Before we do that, we need to know who we are. And if we don't have a good definition of who we are, that gets difficult. So that's job number one uh, right there. And then also we want to make clear what the value of RMAs are, not only at the local level, not only at the micro level, but at the macro, at the system level, um, if we can. Very big ambitions here. I think we can make a, a good step, but this is also, as I, I hopefully have made clear, this is a first strong step, but this is really for me the beginning of something. Um, how are we going to do this? Very quickly, one big co-creation exercise. So we're going to create all sorts of countries, uh, well, we're not going to create countries, but we are going to create a system which will allow countries to set up their own community up on the platform because we would like to get this um, we would like to get this um, this country specific information because it is so uh, important we would like to have that um, element next to the countries themselves which will have ambassadors as we call them community builders who will bring together for events um, we want to um, um, also have um, communities of practice and the community of practice there are the different parts of um, the profession or the developing profession. Uh, I put dot dot here, I think it's 12 or 13. Proposal writers, data stewards, research infrastructure, very important, knowledge brokers, um, knowledge transfer professionals, funding advisors, and so on. Um, I know the terminology is diff difficult, you have different uh, titles everywhere, um, but that's um, the communities that we're looking at. They will also have moderators, which will look um, in a similar way. Um, can I contribute? Well, one of the questions, can I take part in this? Yes, yes, yes. So everybody who wants, who has a role uh, such as ours, we want to make it one big co-creation exercise. And if a lot of people participate, we can at the end of the project also say, of course, this is what the community wants and needs, which is much stronger than if we get some good people designing something that is nice and intelligent, but doesn't necessarily represent um, uh, the view um, of, of the larger whole. So 
RM, yeah. This should normally not be blue, <laughs> but something happened in the transfer, um, so it's hard to read in this way, but um, we've got um, six work packages. I've already set the main objectives. They're aligned with these work packages. One, advice leading, uh, which is on intelligence. Who are we? And information about us. Two, what training is available. Three, what is the future? And also, what is the business case that we can put forward to policymakers as this is why our community, or this, this is what our community can do uh, for you, but we need this and this to be able to um, do that. The community platform is work package four, together with uh, dissemination and communication. Uh, we can share the slide, so should you be wondering that. Um, work package five, is a management of the project and then sustainability led by ASTP Proton because they have done something similar in the past. They actually, they're called ASTP Proton, they were called ASTP, then did a project and merged more or less with that project and gave it a, a longer, much longer life. Now I think it's up to um, uh, 10 years. So they have done that partly, so they will um, um, do that also within this project. Now. I've talked about the, um, the bottom-up momentum, the top-down momentum. We've got a project that is ready to get going, that wants to gather as much intel as possible and tell the European Commission, but not just the European Commission, all stakeholders, this is where we want to go with our community, this is what we can do. Um, so top-down momentum, bottom-up momentum. Now, how do you fit into this? One, please participate in the project if you want to, if you can, um, get your um, uh, colleagues involved. Um, but what you can do from the bottom-up perspective is be a good RMA, build trust, get appreciation from your researchers, and also show it. This is something I, in my career in the beginning, um, also very much thought, okay, I work very hard and well, and people will notice. Now, that is not always the case. If you've got a very good manager, that's, that's great, but you have a larger organization in a lot of cases, and a lot of managers, they work in showcasing the big successes and the things that are nice to show to the uh, outside world, and focusing on critical failure um, um, events, things that are not working well, meaning if you're a university and your registration tool shuts down, the attention and the um, towards the IT, the attention and investment will be endless, that will be fixed. So if you are an RMA, which is already not the most, let's say, easy, understandable and not the most um, easy to explain um, 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 position within the organization, it's even more important to show it and then policymakers will get it. Like, I, I, I really love the presentation of the vice rector here. I, I, I um, said in a lot of cases, um, I referred to him, because he did get it. Because of the way he was explaining it, he did get it. And that's where we need to get to people that are of that level that will um, in, uh, yeah, invest in our community. Um, I am getting the signal to round up, and we are almost there, so that is great. Um, so this momentum, the project, a game changer. So will everything now happen for us? The commission is working on it. Um, we are developing ourselves at a rapid pace. Um, associations are popping up. Are we there? No. We are at the very beginning, but we have great momentum. And that's why I also called the presentation the momentum in Europe. We, we're not there, we have not arrived, but we have got key opportunities. And when can the real game changer happen? Um, the game changer for me is at the national level. Because if you, kn if you know the, um, the part of funding, European funding, as opposed to national funding, is quite small actually. Um, and also, if you look at it, um, the, um, uh, the commission can do something, but it's really who is funding RMAs. It's the organizations, it's the, uh, research performing organizations, research funding organizations, the ministries are determining it. So the real game changer can be there when enough policymakers realize we must invest in these people because this is what we will get out of it for the system and when we do that then I think there can be a real game changer so we have opportunities now we have a start now a lot has been done a lot of people are engaging network is being built um, like here today but we are at the beginning and I call upon you also for my uh, for my final words to contribute to that wherever you can and the first thing is being good at your job being motivated and most of you are or you would probably not be um, in this room. So next to this, what can we do from the project? Participate, but we're also going to build a business case. And one of the parts of that business case is what is our importance and how do you explain that to policymakers? And we want to, everything will be open in the project. We want to give that to you. We want to give that to um, the, the national communities and say, run with it do your thing, and we try to help you as much as possible. But in the end, it is the national community that will have to, um, from the one hand, look at the national policymakers and say what we can do. 
And from the other hand, we hope also that sort of the leadership role of the European Commission top down and those two signals combined, we hope can turn into a better future for RMA, for researchers and for the research system and the world as a whole. So that's what we are trying to achieve. And I hope you will contribute to that. And I thank you for your attention. The next session uh, aims to provide you with some kind of background on the profession. We will start with uh, the literature, how you can use it. Then we will get to know some uh, current figures, statistics, and then some nice examples from Poland will come. Uh, please, for this time, I would like to suggest to first listen to the presentations collect your questions, and at, after all the three presentations, I will open up the floor to all the questions to all the, our speakers. So first, I would like to uh, give the floor to Dr. Susie Poli, who is uh, coming from the University of Bologna. Currently, she is uh, the leader of staff development in the educational division, and also uh, leading the Climate Kick program. Uh, basically, I'm just wondering whether I should tell more or not, but she has carried extensive research, published a number of publications, and also a book on research management, on higher education development, or, and also nice topics like leadership for women in higher education. So now, Susie, the floor is yours, and we are happy to learn from you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. No? I can say the other way? Okay. 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 This is... Uh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is uh, my presentation, and uh, I think uh, it follows uh, quite well I could say all the previous presentations, so about the momentum, about the value of the profession and how to strengthen the profession and the professionalism of all of us. So I'm going to tell you something about the importance of doing research into the profession. So not just leaving the profession as RMAs, but doing research into what we are doing and why we are doing so. Briefly on uh, me, I work at Bologna University, but not in the research division. I was a research manager for more than 10 years, and, uh, and in 2008, I, I started doing research into higher education management and research management as well. And uh, I've been doing research since... Uh, 2008, so quite a long time. At the beginning, nobody cared about uh, doing research into the profession. I was uh, the only one, more or less, attending my sessions. But I think uh, the interest in this profession has grown uh, quite a lot, and people can really understand why we should uh, do research into this profession. And, uh, okay, so uh, I'm not going to cover all the topics in, uh, I could say, depth. So I could say just, uh, I could say, I want to give you a short introduction about uh, this kind of research and give even some tips uh, and readings uh, to be suggested to you to start with. So uh, why doing research into RMA? And why should we do that? And uh, the second point uh, will be uh, I say about introducing you to this uh, leading figure in uh, research in higher education and higher education management. We have uh, spoken a lot about the importance of the higher education sector, which uh, is not, uh, I could say, well considered all the times uh, we speak about uh, RMA. And uh, I say this uh, even uh, for people, uh, I could say, who are RMAs uh, not uh, in universities. So the field of higher education studies uh, and higher education management uh, should be regarded as uh, the main framework uh, in which uh, we place, uh, I would say, all the types of research, all the studies we want to, we want to do into the profession. 
Uh, and Barton Clark, uh, this uh, American sociologist, is uh, really the leading figure, I could say, able to easily introduce you to, I could say, these, uh, I could say, quite tough topics. Uh, the third point uh, will be about, uh, I could say, oh, I mean, when we start doing research into RMA, where should we uh, move from? And uh, I could say my suggestion is uh, uh, to move from, I could say, shaping your understanding of what professionalism is in today's RMA. Uh, the fourth point is about engaging with the research into RMA and uh, I could say briefly talking about academic and professional literature in RMA, but also with the research into higher education and higher education management and why not uh, with the institutional research uh, even in a few bites. And uh, the last point is about discussing some pieces, uh, but uh, just to be given to you, and uh, then uh, you, you, you can find the time to read through these pieces and start uh, doing, uh, I could say, start shaping your understanding and uh, moving on doing your own research into your profession, which is the profession of everyone, but uh, I could say just a split in the small pieces, all of you, can do and uh, can contribute uh, to the whole picture. Uh, what uh, I could say, this presentation is meant to be, I could say, this uh, I could say broad overview of uh, of research into into RMA. But at the same time, uh, why not calling this uh, I could say type of research uh, even one of the new skills uh, uh, in demand? Uh, I could say in uh, the tough times uh, we are just uh, in. So, uh, first point, uh, why doing research? Uh, I, I'm going to tell you why I do research into RMA. And uh, the first point, uh, gaining the understanding, I already said to you, so I want to understand what I'm doing, why, and in uh, which kind of organizational structure uh, my bosses, directors want uh, me to be. Uh, <laughs> I keep doing, I keep, collect I keep collecting data in uh, my everyday job, and, uh, and uh, I do a lot of analysis of uh, all the data I can collect, and um, even by using different methods. And uh, so, going back to Nick's uh, point uh, about, uh, I could say, systematically, I could say, um, looking at uh, what we uh, have at the moment, uh, I'm going. To, I'm, I'm, I normally connect uh, data with uh, the results uh, I've got, uh, and I try to use. Uh, I mean, uh, to manage uh, complexity, the complexity of everyday's, uh, I could say, research uh, uh, landscape, uh, which is really, I could say, a very high top point. And uh, I normally share the results, uh, and uh, I could say ask uh, peers uh, to reflect uh, on the data and uh, on the results with me. So I'm doing a kind of research with, which is academic research, but at the same time translated into my own community, which is the community of uh, higher education professionals I work with. Not just, uh, I could say, not just RMAs, because I think uh, that uh, I could say to be successful and to raise uh, the visibility of this profession, we need to engage the whole community of higher education professionals. So I work in the community with the higher education professionals and I try to raise their awareness of the importance of, uh, I could say, understanding who they are and why they are doing what they do in today's university. And uh, Barton Clark, I could say a few things about him. I could say uh, the leading figure to understand why we should all together engage ourselves uh, with uh, doing research into higher education and research management. He was a sociologist uh, teaching in all the main uh, US universities, uh, Berkeley, Yale, uh, uh, Stanford, Harvard, and so on. And um, he was uh, the first social sociologist doing research uh, into higher education from the global perspective uh, and even in a, in a comparative uh, way. And uh, if you look at the long list of uh, uh, studies and uh, books uh, he, he published, uh, you can see many things uh, around the profession, the education system, the entrepreneurial university, which is uh, 
a lot about uh, RMA, today's RMA, and much more. So I could say, go and uh, read uh, Barton Clark, uh, because it's really, really amazing and inspiring in a lot of ways. Uh, even to, I could say, start, move from Barton Clark to do your own research into RMA. Understanding ideas of professionalism, I'm going just to I could say pick up, uh, I could say what Ronald Barnett uh, uh, thinks uh, about, uh, I could say, uh, today's idea of professionalism. Uh, his suggestion is about, uh, I could say, uh, understanding that knowledge has a limited life span, time span, so skills are already outdated. And uh, we need to, I could say, shape and uh, reshape new skills, uh, I could say, every day, every week. And um, his suggestion is to move away from the regulated professional and embrace or become a modern, more creative professional in your own profession. Not, uh, I could say, ideally, but I could say something rooted, grounded, I could say, in the practice of the profession or your profession. And um, I could say one more point is about uh, this uh, new professional that should become a living project of knowledge in action. And, uh, and uh, I could say, yes, just to sum up, uh, I could say, she, uh, <laughs> it's very nice, uh, she, in the, she, I could say, mentioned in the text, uh, is uh, the person, uh, I could say, doing action, taking action with the courage in uh, today's really fragile uh, domain of professionalism. Uh, it's not really easy to read uh, Ronald Barnett, uh, I could say, in the full, I could say, uh, in, in full, but uh, I could say, uh, in a small, uh, I could say, in a small pieces, uh, try to engage yourself with uh, this kind of reading, uh, which is uh, a lot philosophical, but uh, really full of inspiration for everyone to, I could say, shape the frame, so your own idea of professionalism. Examples of professionalism, I think Nick has already said a lot about Yarma, so I could say when we try to, I could say, materialize examples of professionalism, we can find all around us, we can look at professional associations, their PD frameworks, their qualifications, their working groups, they, all the calls for research I've recently found around me from South Africa, from India, from many places, asking you to do your own research into the workplace. And projects, the roadmap, but I've been doing two more Erasmus projects on, I could say, higher education professionals to strengthen their profession. So with the European Network Alliance Una Europa and one more on educational leaders. And I'm doing, I could say, research into different types of higher education professionals because they want to tackle RMAs from all the possible angles. So if I can make the whole community more engaged, I can get the visibility straight to the point. And the point is our community because it's, uh, I mean, not set in stone, but we can claim that it's the more advanced or more investigated community at the moment. Uh, more examples, so I think uh, Nick showed a very nice, I could say, uh, table uh, with the, all the professional associations uh, globally. And uh, there's a, a very interesting Italian report, I could say, uh, tracking not just, uh, I could say, all the professional associations uh, uh, globally and uh, their professional development frameworks, uh, their qualifications, and uh, everything you can find. So I could say look at this report because it's really, really interesting with the full of opportunities for all of you to grab. Research. Research is RMA. What, uh, what does it mean? It's about everything you can read. It's about professional literature. So all the journals you can find uh, uh, from IARMA, from ARMA, from uh, SRA, from Encura, and uh, even some of the blogs uh, you can find on LinkedIn is, uh, can be called and regarded as, uh, I could say, professional literature. And, um, and you have, uh, I could say, also academic literature. I've just selected a 
a few uh, pieces from you, very easy. This one, uh, the interface of science, uh, I could say Virag mentioned this definition before, and it's about, uh, uh, I could say, uh, this uh, um, paper trying to understand, uh, I could say, more or less, uh, I could say, the boundaries of this profession and uh, all the different uh, groups uh, in uh, today's RMA that could be, I could say, included into the, this definition. The paper is uh, much more, and I'm going to show you something else uh, later on. This one, uh, this uh, paper is a very nice one. It's uh, one of the first uh, systematic literature review of the profession. So you can find lots of topics covered about strategy, about organizational structures, about, uh, I could say, being effective in today's uh, RMA, and much, much more. And uh, I've tried uh, to put together this table for you to give you, I could say, um, to show you, I could say, in, uh, in the practice, uh, I mean, uh, the value, the importance of engaging yourself uh, with uh, these readings. And uh, I put the paper, the main points, uh, some of the main points uh, you can find, uh, I could say, in the paper, and the benefits uh, you can read uh, by reading each of these uh, uh, studies. And uh, so this is practice. This is not something only, yes, academic. And uh, I've uh, also added uh, to this selection for you one more piece, uh, and uh, it's about uh, our identities, uh, professional identities. So it's about who do they think they are, which is more or less uh, your, the, 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 the title of uh, your work package, <laughs> package <laughs> Virag. So about, uh, I could say, getting the understanding of uh, our roles, uh, our identities uh, in today's profession. This is, uh, I could say, mainly about higher education management, but, but uh, this uh, paper gives you the, the example of uh, why we should, I could say, look at higher education management as uh, the umbrella literature and then going down into RMA. So, I could say, read uh, this paper, which is even very easy. Uh, I could say it's kind of a hybrid paper, I would say. So, it's a lot... Uh, professional and not a lot academic. And uh, I could say the last point is about what uh, I've been doing at my university. So I work in the education division, uh, collecting data and uh, I could say raising the awareness of my colleagues and uh, I could say designing and running seminars for people to understand themselves, uh, who they are and what uh, they do, and uh, this kind of research I've been doing is called institutional research. Comes uh, from the US, uh, where it was established uh, more than 50 years ago, I could say mainly, I could say, to uh, make, uh, I could say, good, uh, to inform uh, the, um, uh, the, the decision-making process. And uh, it was not about uh, people and stuff, but uh, I could say even uh, more recently in the UK and in Europe, I could say uh, many more researchers or professionals uh, are going to engage with institutional research about stuff, about ourselves, about, uh, I could say, the worthy workforce in uh, RMAs. And uh, this is all. Just a short introduction and uh, everything I want to, I could say, give uh, to you and uh, hope, uh, I could say, you can engage yourself with, uh, I could say, some of these readings. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Susie, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I hope it inspired most of us to go further on the research and to learn more what is already written and how it can be continued. Now I would give the floor to Dr. Simon Carriage, who will present us some details on the RAP survey, as he loves these kind of acronyms, we all know. Uh, he is an honorary member of the University of Kent, if I'm right, and also the founder of uh, Carriage Consul Research Consulting. Basically, he's in research management for 25 years or more. Uh, he has been involved in 
ARMA, so the UK association, but now in eARMA as well, and I could continue, but probably he will provide a more in-depth <laughs> introduction. So Simon, the floor is yours. Oh, it is a bit scary up here at the front, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks, uh, Susie and, uh, and Nick, for all those great talks. And I do apologise for not wearing a, a tie, but I'm retired, so that's fine. Uh, also, uh, I will try to speak slowly because I'm really good at speaking fast. And if anyone wants to take a photograph of me, this is the best view. <laughs> Um, I'll also try not to wave my hands around too much because Susie is much better at being expressive with her hands. So anyway, we shall see. Um, I like dogs. These aren't even my dogs, but I put them on my, my slide because they're so cute. I will talk about, I, I can't pronounce it as well as Virag, RAP, I would say, but RAP, um, which is Research Administration as a Profession, and it's Research Administration because it's originally um, a US-funded uh, initiative, and they call Research Management Administration Research Administration. Um, I'll talk a little bit about RAP2 data, and I will then encourage you, if you haven't already, to fill out the RAP3 survey, and we will get to there, don't worry. And you want to make it 10 minutes instead of 15, yeah, okay, right, let's be fast. So, uh, that's me. Um, you'll get the slides afterwards, so you don't need to see all of that. And I don't get a blue background, hooray. Uh, and I've done a few things, and that's what I look like in the mirror after a bad day. More importantly, more dogs. Uh, these are some of the main players who have been involved in rap over the, goodness me, look at that, seven years since we started in 2015. Basically, uh, three big surveys, we do it once every three years. The current one is open. If you're finding me boring, there's a link there. I know you can't quite see it, but fill that in instead of listening to me. Okay, so uh, 2,600 responses from the first survey. That data has been available. We've written about it, and I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, 4,324 responses from the second survey. That's from 2019. Uh, as I said, we're currently doing the 2022 uh, survey, so obviously we don't have that data yet. Um, initially, we split out Europe from the UK. You'll notice this is before Brexit, so nothing to do with that. Um, it was just because we had sufficient responses from the UK to be able to do analyses on that, as opposed to the rest of Europe, or continental Europe, as we like to call it. But that includes Ireland. Okay, so um, 1,525 from Europe. So there's plenty of data there. So any, da any figures I show you are almost certainly going to be statistically significant. So you can use this in your reports and um, hopefully maybe work out efficiency gains and things like that. Um, as you say, lots of different countries responded. Uh, the big brown. How, how poetic is the UK responses. The other big responses there are um, Finland, Germany, Norway, uh, Portugal. So uh, where do research managers and administrators work? So at the bottom, uh, so in all of these slides, I hope, I have divided up the responses from Europe into uh, widening uh, countries, which is blue, uh, according to the EU definition, um, and the non-widening countries, which are uh, orange, or if you're from a non-widening country, gold. But yeah, let's say orange. Um, so you can see that almost all research managers and administrators who responded to the survey uh, work in those uh, sort of bottom three, bottom four areas, so universities and research institutes. The big difference there, dare I try the laser pointer? It's not going to work, is it? Ooh, it does work. Uh, so the big difference here is you've got uh, far fewer of the uh, sort of uh, Western Europe, non-widening, working in research institutes, or rather a lot from widening uh, countries working in research institutes rather than universities. Uh, how many years have you been doing it for? Well, the profiles are pretty similar. I don't think I want to draw out any information on that because we don't have much time. Um, but yes, look, look at that. Not even me, that one, over 40, but yeah, some, some really uh, experienced, I was going to say old, experienced people. Um, what about your employment status? So here, RA means RMA, if you remember it was the US originally. So 75% of us are full-time research managers and administrators. 
Well, there are quite a few, over 10%, who are part-time, but that appears to be only in the non-widening countries. There don't appear to be any part-time research managers and administrators in widening countries. I have no explanation for that, so that uh, could be interesting. And then the other uh, points above that are things who, people who, for example, like Susie, who might consider herself to have been, at one point in her career, a research manager and a researcher at the same time. So there are some of those uh, blended roles. This is perhaps a more disappointing slide. Uh, is your role permanent or is it fixed term? Um, and as you can see, a much higher proportion of uh, people from, uh, who work as RMAs in widening countries are on um, fixed term positions. So that's about 35% as opposed to about 15% in, in the rest of Europe. Um, and I imagine we, we all know the reasons for that probably associated with projects and so on. Uh, what about educational alignment? Uh, is your educational background aligned with the research areas that you support? So do you have a science degree and do you support science? Um, so at the bottom it's, it's yes and then you've sort of a yeah, little bit and then partially and then the fourth one up is no. Uh, the, the top one with any data in is not applicable which is well I'm kind of work at the university center so that doesn't make any sense as a question but again if you look down at the bottom there is it, you know do you know, are you aligned um, that's over 25 percent in widening countries as opposed to only about 15 percent and and that's perhaps an indication of the maturity if you like of the profession because it's perhaps perceived that you know you might need to have that experience or expertise or probably you're actually employed on a project related to that so I preempted myself. Uh, here is the, is it important um, that your subject area is aligned uh, with that which you support? Um, and as you can see at the bottom, which is yes, it of course is important, you've got nearly 45% of uh, RMAs from widening countries who say that they believe it's important that they have that same academic background as the researchers they're supporting. Uh, whereas it's sort of flipped, if you like, um, and uh, there are more RMAs from non-widening countries who say that it's not important. Uh, I've also put the graph on uh, as a pie chart for the, the responses across the world and that those three ones are uh, yes, a little bit, and no. So uh, it's very much a, a split decision on that. So uh, more work to be done. And yeah, maybe after Susie's presentation, you'll be inspired to do some research and find out why. Um, where do you work in the organization? Central office, about 60%. Um, Non-central office, so a devolved research management office is about 10% or something. Um, and then 20% in, in an academic department, so perhaps just working for a series of PIs. And, and that's very much the same uh, between widening and non-widening countries. Um, how many jobs? Well, a sort of a bell curve there, lots of people. Uh, and then uh, my, my favorite one, which is uh, my history is rather complex. Um, sh can I say labyrinthine, Susie? I can, yes. Um, so yeah, we, we're not really quite sure how many jobs we've had because it was all very fluid. Um, what about your highest academic attainment before you became research manager administrator? So the top there, you can see widening, non-widening, very similar. So the top one is doctorates. So that's about a third of us have had doctorates before we started. Um, a further 40% had masters and practically everyone else has had bachelor's degrees. So very highly qualified as a profession. Um, and that's actually slightly higher than the global average because in the US there tend to be fewer people with, with doctorates who, who are research managers. Um, what about qualifications during your time as being a research manager? So have we done that continual professional development? Well, 70-80% um, of the non-widening um, said no, we didn't actually bother because we were too busy working, um, whereas 60% of people from widening didn't do anything. But so the other 40% did, and most of those have done masters during their time as research managers. And I'd be interested to find out was that something because you were doing it anyway, or did you feel that this is going to help your career? Um, what about the subject area? Um, I, I, we talked about was, it, uh, was that alignment important or not? Um, so here we're just seeing that research managers, administrators come from every background. 
Um, perhaps, interestingly, uh, if you look at the orange bars, there tends to be more orange, so more of the non-widening in arts and humanities. Um, and for the widening countries, you're perhaps more who have a business or engineering background. But, but overall, it's, it's still a good mix. Interesting mix. Um, okay, what about certification? So, uh, do you have certification? Uh, about 10% across Europe, doesn't matter if it's widening or, or, or non-widening. Um, and I can see them there, I've, I've listed them out, there are 41 with uh, EIMO qualifications. Um, one, working in Europe with an Australasian qualification. So, I'm assuming they moved or didn't just take the wrong one. So, in terms of those professional qualifications, here is the data for the whole 4,000. Um, and if you have a professional qualification, sort of the bigger bar chart that weren't there, um, I've shown it with operational on the right, and then managerial, and then leadership. So that's this one here. So uh, having a professional qualification research management is more likely to be associated with being a higher level position. Um, um, there's no necessarily causation there, but there's, there's correlation. Um, and you can see here, we've done it by geographic region. That one's the USA, that one's uh, Australasia, and uh, here we have sort of the UK and Europe. So you can see a lot more of it um, So you know, in, in the US and Australasia, because it's been around a little bit longer. Um, just while you're thinking, oh, I must do a professional uh, qualification because I'll get promoted, uh, here's the equivalent graph for uh, operational, managerial, and then the most senior leadership positions, and these are doctorates and masters and so on. So uh, also, uh, it's worth having a doctorate. So just do both, you've got plenty of spare time. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, here's a very interesting slide. Of the people who responded to the surveys, uh, are you a member of uh, EAMA or of BESPRAC? Um, and unsurprisingly, a lot more or a higher proportion of the widening um, country respondents are members of BESPRAC. Uh, but if you look at overall, it's, it's only 20% for, for EAMA. Plenty of opportunity there, Nick, uh, and, and, and for best practice. So there are a lot of people out there who are kind of not associated properly, if you like. They're probably well networked, but um, perhaps haven't joined the network. Is there a value proposition that they're not seeing? Or do they just not know that there is one? Uh, okay, age, not a huge difference there. I suppose the only thing to point out is hardly any research managers, administrators across Europe who are under 25. Um, I have no explanation other than we didn't know it was a job, so you can't apply for it until you know it's a job, right? So it takes, it takes a while to realize, maybe. Um, responses by gender, again, very similar. Um, that's about the international average, about 75, 77% female. <laughs> I got that the right way around, didn't I? Um, here is my depressing slide, I'm afraid. Um, this is the gender, and I've just shown, shown the proportion who are female this time. Um, the numbers are pretty similar, apart from this strange um, spike here. So uh, these, these are operational staff, ma uh, managerial staff, and leadership staff, and you can see the proportion of females, apart from there, uh, for managerial drops. This is the same data for across the world, so operational, managerial, and leadership, and there is a drop-off in terms of that. So there is a glass ceiling. It's not horrific compared with some other professions, but it is there, and we still need to do something about it. Um, just for something entirely different, RAP2 focused on research impact. Do you support research impact as part of your job? And there's a whole lot more in there. If you're interested in research about supporting research impact, take a look at this data. Um, over 60% of us do that. Uh, so yeah, lots of associations evolved, evolved, involved. At least I haven't created any countries, Nick. Um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, across the world. Um, if you want to get the RAP data, then uh, the links are there, or just search for RAP, three A's on Figshare, and you'll find it, and there's various papers and so on. Um, and, uh, I, oh, ah, yes, I should mention, you can also uh, write for the Journal of Research Management and Administration, which wasn't on Susie's list, but I'm, no, I'm sure she'll add it on for her next time. Um, RAP three. I haven't seen anybody actually filling in the survey now. That either means you've all filled it in already. Please raise your hand. 
Oh, I've shamed some of you. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yes, indeed. And if you haven't, if you haven't then please do. It is open until the end of the month, which is you know, like tomorrow. So, no, so if, honestly, if you're desperate, I'll leave it open for another couple of weeks. It'll be fine. Um, anyway, uh, so these are the uh, three foolish people helping me with the RAP3 survey. Um, we're very much focusing on the how I became a research manager and administrator, so the route into the profession. Um, these are the sorts of questions that we'll be asking. Uh, so, so what were your career aspirations? What, what, what skills brought you into the job? You know, what, what was it that, that, that helped you? And um, trying to get over that. I think it's first described by one of my colleagues. She says, when I first became research manager administrator, uh, somebody told me to drink some water and they gave me a fire hose and I had to just drink from that because the information overload was huge. Um, yeah, so that's it. We'll also be doing some little case studies. And other than that, oh, look, a QR code. So you can take a photograph of it now and do the survey. Did I mention the survey? I, I said two minutes, but that was four. Sorry. Um, so that's it. Uh, I'm done. If any questions, please save them till the end. And uh, we're off to Sigmund now. Thank you very much, Simon. So... If you haven't heard about yet the RAP3 survey, please. <laughs> but uh, only after the next presentation, so please. Uh, because again, we have a wonderful speaker who is uh, Dr. Zygmunt Krasinski. Uh, currently, he is a strategic advisor of the director at the National Center for Research and Development. But similarly to the others, he has also a very long track record in research and administration and how to organize training program associations and how to push EU decision makers to pay more attention to it. So, Sigmund, the floor is yours. Thank you, Virak. Good afternoon, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me for, tea, for, for this very important finals conference, I, I think. Especially, especially in the pandemic time, it is a challenge for our professionals. So, yeah. So, after very interesting presentations and some interesting points done by Simon, so overview of the RAP survey results, uh, Susie, uh, very interesting research on research management and administration, very great point. Our role is to bring together scientists and the industry. So we support them with the, some money in the form of grants, in the form of, uh, in the form of uh, financial instruments as well. But our goal is to, um, to create effective commercialization of research results. It is the goal of our, of our agency. The other task of, of, of our agency is to carry out a task facilitating Poland's social and economic growth but also we seek for solutions to specific global challenges. So, uh, actually, actually uh, we are the largest, largest agency uh, to finance R&D projects in the region, I mean Central Eastern Europe, with the annual budget uh, um, about 7 billion uh, zloty, it means about 1.6 billion euro. For, 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 uh, for um, Polish enterprises, but also universities, research institutions, and so on. We try to encourage both experienced and startup entrepreneurs, but also scientists, uh, in order to work together in, in this collaborative model uh, on, uh, on innovations. And four pillars of our strategy in each pillar, there is an important role for RMA. The first pillar is about operational efficiency and digitization of processes. Yeah? We are a lot of work with uh, programming new instruments, with preparing and managing the programs. Yeah? So, of course, we uh, try to... Um, use all the good practices coming from, from, for example, from implementation of the framing programs as well. But here we need specialists on, in this profession. The second pillar is about providing as wide as possible a range of support instruments. Yeah? So we based on our national programs and EU funds, as I already said. What is our main point? 
Polish technological specializations coming from our, our national uh, potential. And we focus on international co uh, collaboration, so we are increasing activities in this, in this international environment. Since 2020, the end of 2020, the national contact point uh, is located in our agency, but the uh, National Center for Research and Development is also a scientific partner of Business Science Poland in Brussels. This, uh, this organization is the member of IGLO, IGLO Network. Yeah, and studies and analysis, yeah? We would like to build uh, our center as a knowledge and competence, competence, uh, competence uh, hub. So we need professional RMAs to manage our programs. We need to professional, professional men, um, uh, RMAs uh, in institutions which are our beneficiaries, yes? So it is important. Uh, okay. And yeah, just one example of, of, the, of the, our international success. Uh, our agency won the second place in European Innovation Procurement Awards in category Innovation Procurement Strategies. So we, we implemented the programs um, of innovative uh, pre-commercial procurement in the area of European Green Deal. By the way, um, the employees of agency decided to allocate 25,000 euro <laughs> award uh, for aid and support for our Ukrainian colleagues. And let me show how this process of professional development, um, RMA, uh, professional development of RMA started in Poland. I would like to point uh, one, one thing. Uh, as a new member states, we have joined the framework programs in 1999. It was the beginning of the fifth framework program. So our countries were eligible to receive financing from the programs. At the time, we experienced lack of research managers, but also professional, professional research support offices in our scientific institutions. Uh, what was done then? Uh, the NCP Poland, located uh, at, the, uh, at the time uh, in IPPT PAN, it is the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research, Polish Academy of Sciences, initiated a series of workshops on project management for R&D sector. It was in, uh, started in 2004, and was con the, the, the workshops were conducted by certified project managers. It was very, very useful for, for, for the community, R&D community, and uh, a strong interest was expressed by scientific institutions to educate the staff involved in, in a research project administration. So what we find, uh, we started cooperation with International Project Management Association, the branch of Poland, and we noticed that so-called behavior, behavioral competences yeah, they serve. So-called so soft skills are very, very pertinent for project managers dealing with international collaborating research projects with partners representing different sectors, different countries, and, and so on. So it was the first step. The next step is the breakthrough year, 2007. Uh, breakthrough year uh, in uh, RMA in Poland, I think. So, uh, before starting this year, late in 2006, uh, we organized in Poland inauguration conference of FP7 with a special, special session dedicated to project management with participation of Yarma president, of course, yes. The same year, we organized in Warsaw, at Warsaw University, annual conference of Yarma, yeah. And it was very important for the history of Yarma because in Warsaw, Yarma, started relations with Encura. Encura was attracted by this conference and the representatives of Encura came to Warsaw. And we started very active co collaboration. You remember Encura Emma, International Research Management Fellowship Program, very successful. I remember I was personally the member of the working group to prepare this program. Many times we visit Washington and 
to elaborate as, uh, uh, some good ideas uh, in order to, to, to in, in order to do our best uh, for um, enhancing this this uh, transatlant transatlantic cooperation. And the next important uh, event uh, held in Krakow this year, the International Project Management Association World Congress 2007. It was opened by our former president, Lech Wałęsa, attracted a lot of very important uh, players fro from the world. And of course, one of the sessions was the session of research project management. So we started uh, at this time uh, some dialogue with project managers of the traditional projects, yes? Showing them that we have some challenge. Our projects are, uh, have this technological risk. How to join the forces and, uh, and work on it, yeah? Also, in the, maybe in the direction of common certification of managers and so on. And the bottom-up initiative in the middle of, of this breakthrough year, the Polish Council of Research Project Coordinators of the acronym CRAP was established. Uh, as, as, as Nick uh, said, uh, before it was Parma, now it is CRAP. Maybe we will come back to Parma, we, we don't know, it, it depends uh, on the members of, of this association. Uh, but um, but uh, it is my satisfaction that, that I was one of the co-founders of this association uh, since I coordinated three projects in framework programs. So uh, we may have ordinary status as the coordinator, we may have uh, associated status in our organization as the research managers or administrator. So having such a base, having such a base, we started the new bottom-up initiative. We uh, consider the EU funds as very useful also to invest in the area of research project management and commercialization of research results. So, in the period 2010-2013, in Poland we implemented pioneering projects, yeah, entitled, uh, dedicated to, 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 to this subject. Uh, and uh, as I said, it was co-financed by, by the European Social Fund. Um, it was implemented by seven Polish universities, but also the other partners, for example, uh, IPPT PAN, Education for Ent Entrepreneurship, but also IPMA, Pol uh, IPMA Pol Poland. We cooperated very closely with IARMA and NCURA at this time, because this, the, the, the component of the studies were workshops with um, foreign coordinators, for example. Yeah? Uh, and uh, the uniqueness of these projects uh, concerns the development of the uniform program of studies, so the common database, consistent criteria for recruitment, uh, both lecturers and uh, participants. So 17 postgraduate uh, courses editions at seven universities. As you can see, um, the participants representing 40, 45 universities almost 100 research institutes from across Poland, and a great success, uh, more than 400, uh, 400 graduates, 60% of them also received the status of certified project uh, management associate of IPMA on level, on level, on level, level D. We presented results of this project during the annual conference of Yarma in Vienna. It was Many years ago, yes, but uh, really uh, our foreign expert um, confirmed that it was the first initiative of this type, type but also of this scale in, in Europe. Okay, of course uh, in Poland, okay, okay, we implemented the other education, uh, educational initiatives like dedicated uh, projects focused on education for R and uh, research and innovation development for um, uh, technology transfer support networks. There is a number of uh, postgraduate studies, uh, either postgraduate studies or doctoral uh, courses implemented by several universities, but also train, tailored made trainings. Uh, and the goal, uh, goal, uh, the goal of, of, of all these uh, educational initiatives are to, to become familiar with methods and techniques for project management, but also, um, also uh, with the skills and uh, and uh, and uh, develop the uh, skills for for uh, for AMA, including the soft skills. 
what are the current challenges and opportunities, especially for Visegrad Group and Western Balkans countries in Horizon Europe? Uh, it was a common initiatives of, uh, of, uh, of the member states, especially new member states of Poland, but also Yarma was involved, involved in this. We um, noticed that the rules of framework programs were not prepared to use the whole innovation potential of Europe, especially of the new member states. So starting from the fifth framework program, there were no changes in rules which could open the existing so-called so uh, closed clubs. We managed, we managed to convince, convince uh, the member states, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and in the current Horizon Europe, we have uh, introduced a new horizontal instruments especially the new, ex uh, new exec for se selection criterion based on geographical diversity is very crucial because it is the sign for the leaders that, of course, evaluation is going in the same way, excellence, but the, for the leaders, for coordination, the sign that uh, in the case our project will be evaluated exactly with the others and the commission uh, have to, has to, has to uh, uh, select select the best for financing. In this case, additional selection criteria goes with gender and with, with geographical diversity. It is a chance, I think. And another chance is, uh, and also challenge for RMA, is professional management of teaming and other projects. As we know, the widening package in Horizon Europe is also significantly increased. So we believe that the roles and the tasks of, um, of the countries from our region will be constantly increasing. Also, a great uh, challenge for us, for RMA, is building the synergy on our national programs with, with, the, horizon, with the horizon Europe. So just a few words. Uh, of course, we are actively involved now in, uh, in, in the current edition of the Arab survey. Uh, our our um, Polish Council of Research Project coordinators disseminated the information through the members, but also through the universities, through research institute, institutes, and institutes of Polish Academy of Sciences. So, the last slide. Good, uh, good news, yes. We look to the future. And we believe that we need to continue what we started, yeah? So uh, we believe that over the past decade, we uh, in Poland, the significant effort was done to develop its, uh, its capacity in RMA. Still, there is a need for regular education, but also certification of research managers and administrators, as well as developing of professional research support offices, yeah? as well as welcome offices, because welcome offices especially are dedicated for the foreign students, for a foreign, a foreign, um, a foreign researchers. Yeah? And what is a challenge, we need the better understanding of RMA professionals who are notably situated between the academic and administrative spheres. It is, it is, it is really important. What we believe is, uh, we really believe that the new reform of science implemented by our ministry will create better conditions for developing researchers, but also uh, RMA profession in Poland. So our GERD is systematically, uh, systematically increased. Uh, also, um, there are new excellence initiatives, uh, uh, for example, for example um, multi-year funding for selected the best oriented on research uh, universities on something like that. And Polish universities are also involved, as you know, in European networks of universities and so on. So uh, the need for pro professional uh, research managers is increasing as a result of current opportunities in national programs implemented, for example, by our agency in Poland, but also in, in Horizon Europe. We believe that, that the roles of Polish teams will be constantly, constantly increasing. We appreciate very much the cooperation with Yarma and the role of professional associations at all, especially in uh, RMA education and certification. And what is our goal? To be more visible on European level. So let us go ahead. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sigmund, again, for this very nice overview. And I, I think the example of Poland is very valuable for all of us who are sitting here and can give us further motivation how to start and, and to learn the good practices. And of course, sometimes the bad practices can, can be useful. Unfortunately, we are a bit uh, ahead uh, of behind our schedule. But still, I would say, if any of you has any urgent and quick question, feel free to share it. Unless I would encourage you to go to our speakers during the coffee break, either now or the next one, and uh, just uh, talk about the RAP3 or any other important topics. Uh, so now the coffee break is on.